Have you ever had one of those brilliant ideas that is so good it just keeps tap, tap, tapping in the inside of your head and it won't go away and it won't let you rest? And no matter how far you try to push it to the back, it somehow keeps inching forward. You can see it. You can almost feel it. How hard could it be? An unmet clinical need, great science, and an opportunity to save lives. How good. That idea was still tap, tap, tapping inside my head as I sat in my car in an abandoned parking lot down at Griffith, with the rain trickling over my windscreen, waiting for my Chinese colleague to arrive with a priceless package. My mind was buzzing, only matched by the overhead light above and a million crazed mosquitoes. He was getting late and I was getting twitched. Because through the week he'd phoned me and he reckoned he'd cracked the manufacturing problem. He could get enough. I got so excited. I transferred my own money, a Scotsman, transferring his own money <laughs> into his bank account. I could see him start to arrive. The car drove up alongside mine. His window went down. We said hello. I turned to the back seat of my car and gave him 400 ampules of drug to pass over. He checked the number, closed the window. <laughs> he drove off into the darkness and my mind drove off into the fast lane of opportunity because he was going to create from this drug a perfect fine white powder that would change the life of millions. So what was this idea that was in the back of the head that had me in this car park that sounded like a really bad rerun of Breaking Bad? <laughs> the idea evolved from the idea of our lungs, that if we can use these organs that have been brilliantly developed to breathe in a life-saving drug, oxygen, perhaps we could adapt that to breathe in another life-saving drug, adrenaline. The idea is that we could deliver immediate care to the community when patients had life-threatening conditions like anaphylaxis and cardiac arrest. Because in times like this, every second counts. So I drove back and I started thinking, what was it that got me in that car park? Why did I get interested in medicine and innovation? Being a Scot, we invented anaesthetics, antiseptics and antibiotics. And I've always been fascinated as a wee boy listening to these visionaries who dared to dream with their eyes wide open and then give birth to the reality. They were game changers and I realized that all the true medics that I loved were rule breakers and revolutionaries. Have a think, Joseph Lister, he invented antiseptics. People thought he was a fool at the time and now he's described universally as the father of modern surgery. Walt Lillehy, a giant in the cardiovascular space, he saved the wee boy's life by operating on his heart whilst attaching the father's circulation to the son because no one had developed a heart-lung bypass machine. Closer to home, Charlie Marshall. Charlie was so convinced that an ulcer was caused by a bug in your stomach that he went to a patient with an ulcer and drank his second-hand warm stomach contents to prove his hypothesis. And what did he win for this? A really big ulcer but an even bigger Nobel Prize for medicine. Closer to home, my grandmother was also a bit of a revolutionary, but more of a different color. She was the first ever woman to be accepted into medicine in Northern Ireland, because until that time, it was dirty and disgusting that any woman should even consider becoming a doctor. She got in and her father kicked her out, but she didn't back away. In fact, as a medical student in 1916, when the Irish tried to reclaim their country, she sat behind the post office bandaging the Irish men and women that had been shot, but she saw too many of them dying. And she realized they had to do better because patients were dying on the way to the hospital. So she and her med student colleagues created a field hospital that many did at the time to save time and bring the hospital to the patient rather than watch them die. 
So my thought was, with this adrenaline, perhaps I could emulate my grandma to a little extent and provide adrenaline in these life-sitting situations where every second counts. And it did occur to me there was a theme running through this. The heroes I read about in the medical textbook or the stories my grandma told me on her knees sitting in her kitchen. Not one of these people accepted the answer that you had to stay with things the way it was. Every one of them became the change that they saw was necessary to improve the outcome in their field. They saw boundaries, but they saw boundaries as opportunities and chances. They didn't see them as barriers to improving healthcare and changing lives. When I arrived in Australia as a young medic, I was fascinated by the area of cardiac disease. It was already the number one killer and growing bigger and bigger. And we had to do better. And we started the critical care research group in Prince Charles, where numerous people do some great work around this area. One area we were interested in was cardiac arrests. It's increasing every day. And if you have your arrest outside the hospital, your mortality is almost 90%. Surely something can be done better than that. I remember whilst bathing one of my five kids one night, I got a panicked phone call from a friend. He'd been playing touch footy and a mate had gone down in the pitch and had a cardiac arrest. So I'm bathing a child on the phone, phoning the paramedics, telling them how to do CPR and getting the team ready at Prince Charles. They took him to theatre and did a great job of opening his blood vessels whilst he's unconscious on the life support machine. The next morning I went to intensive care, I saw a really panicked wife and three young children, similar ages to my own. They were all so happy, his heart was recovering. And I took the breathing tube out, tears of joy from everyone, until he started to speak. He couldn't remember his wife's name. He couldn't remember two of his kids' name. He thought it was 1977, and he couldn't count to 10. This happens all too often when we get the heart restarted. That's great, but the brain is irreversibly injured. Age 44, he would go home, but he'd go home a different man. He wouldn't be able to remember his kids' birthdays or how he taught them to ride the bike. There was nothing could be done. Because the problem is in cardiac arrest, 95% of them don't happen at the Prince Charles. They happen outside in the community, in the footy pitches. And there, there's no doctor. There's no machine that goes bing. And there's no immediate care. And in cardiac arrest, the key to success is immediate care. And that's why we all learn CPR, so we can get a little bit of oxygen-rich blood to go up to the brain and try and keep it moving. And that's great. And then the two features that have really been shown to improve outcome are early electricity with defibrillation or immediate adrenaline. Now, the automated external defibrillator, or the AED, has changed outcome tremendously. Anyone can use it. All you need to do is rip the pack, stick the pads on the chest, stand back, the machine analyzes the rhythm, delivers a shock, and people return to life. It's an amazing device. The second one is trickier because adrenaline needs to be delivered by a carefully placed needle into the vein. That's hard enough for a doctor to do that or a paramedic, not a bystander. They're never going to be able to do that, surely. But that little idea had started to grow and started to tap in the inside of my cranium. I remembered my footy mate who had gone home a shell of the man that he had been the week before. I thought of the hundreds, maybe even thousands of patients that had come to harm because of our inadequate and ineffective treatment with their lives destroyed and the lives of the family as well destroyed. We had to do better. Okay, so we're not going to manage to get into vein. What are there other ways? There are other ways. You'll remember John Travolta stabbing Uma Thurman in the chest with a 10-inch needle and bringing her back to life. That's great in Pulp Fiction. 
But I can't see my mum doing that in St. Helens Church in downtown Glasgow. So what other way is there? And then I started to think about the lungs because every breath we take, we're breathing in oxygen, the most valuable drug that we have. And perhaps if we can adapt that, we can breathe in other drugs and it already happens. The anaesthetic drugs you get when you go to hospital to become unconscious for an operation, they're gases, they go down to the base of the lungs, the particles go across and you go to sleep. Every one of you smokers out there knows you're not really that interested in nicotine patches, nicotine gums, are you? You want that wonderful, <sighs> brilliant inhalation, the first hit of nicotine that gets you going. And the reason it gets you going is the evolutionary miracle that is the human lung. Millions and trillions of air sacs deep down below, surrounded by blood vessels with the surface area the equivalent to two football pitches. So I thought, well, if we can get oxygen in there, maybe we can get adrenaline. If we can shrink it small enough, we can get it down to those air sacs. Because if it gets to the air sacs, it gets to the blood, the heart, and then the brain. So this was the crazy idea that had me in Breaking Bad in a dodgy car down underneath a broken lamppost. So we got our fine white powder, took it to our labs, and printed our smart device to blow the adrenaline deep down into the lung. We thought we were pretty smart. We took the device, we marched to theatre, already imagining the headlines of our success giving the first breath of life. And it was an absolute failure. The device exploded. There was plumes of adrenaline everywhere except in the model. We were wiping our faces, buzzing a wee bit too much. Occupational health and safety were outside doing this. OK, we'll not count that as a success, I thought. But success is frequently defined as moving from failure to failure with undiminished enthusiasm. And I've failed in a million things, so it doesn't really bother me too much. So we went back to the lab with the team. We worked out what the problem has been, and we printed smart inhaler hashtag two. Went to bed, rose with the sun the next morning, got our device, and headed to the lab. This time it worked a dream. We got the adrenaline into circulation. Within two minutes, we had 20,000 times the amount of adrenaline in the blood than anyone else. We were 10 times faster than any other human study had ever been. This worked. And what this meant was we had saved 20 minutes of brain time. So we had shown that this could work, at least in the lab. So we started thinking, what else could we use this for? Anaphylaxis. The incidence of life-threatening allergy has increased for some reason more than 300% in the last 10 years. And the treatment is the same. It's adrenaline. But because these patients can move, they can deliver the adrenaline with a syringe and a sharp needle with a 20 kilogram punch into their leg. It has definitely saved hundreds, perhaps thousands of lives. But it's not perfect. And still in hospitals, we see people who die or come to harm. Why? Almost 90% of people that use this device don't actually use it properly. Half of the people that know they've got life-threatening anaphylaxis refuse to carry it. It's a major problem. And can any of you sitting there imagine choking to death going, I know, I'm going to get the needle out of my pocket and jab myself in my leg, or even worse, your child's leg? What if we thought, what if we can use our smart inhaler and our adrenaline as a breath of life, getting it into the lungs. Researchers are all passionate people. But the problem is, I realize that now, that if we wanted great research to come off a library shelf and onto a hospital shelf, that's the only way we can achieve outcomes. That's the only way we can change the outcomes of people at my footy mate. We needed to think differently, because Good ideas, hard work, and a clinical need are not enough. All too often, if you go with innovation to a hospital administrator, 
computer says no. <laughs> so I had two choices. I could go with the hospital administrator, or I could go with my grandma's voice tapping away inside the head. I chose my grandma's voice, not surprisingly. Full steam ahead, game on, remove it from the hospital system, put her own money in, make a company, have a go. Get a team outside of medicine, get the engineers, the business people, industry and finance, tell them that together we can make a difference and save people's lives. We backed it with our own money and it was a gamble. Several weeks later, that idea had me in a plane on the way to Qatar. I didn't know where it was. I'd got a call the night before from the Emir, or the Sheikh, who told me if I turned up, he liked the idea, he liked the opportunity, and if I came across, we could strike a deal. And I don't think he's ever recovered from seeing a short, wee, balding Glaswegian walk into the palace dressed in fine Arabic attire that I'd bought at the market before. <laughs> That'll teach him for being late. Whether it was the shock of that or just his sense of humour, he signed a several million dollar deal that allowed me to create the opportunity and turn the adrenaline dream into the start of reality. My grandma, the inspiration for me doing medicine, died at home of a cardiac arrest. Maybe if someone had come before me and thought outside the box, she could have changed more lives and told me more stories in her knee in her kitchen. Because that great medic researcher, Dr. Muhammad Ali said, <laughs> impossible is just a big word used by small men who find it easier to live in the world than being given than to use the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing.